So the cardinal is sitting outside in a scene in a garden. That doesn't mean that the artist can't put him next to the sea. <laughs> done optically, done from the artist's imagination. It's a composite. Or you can put him indoors. Or you can put him with his buddies. This is a crucial <laughs> feature. These are not photographs. They're more complicated than photographs. Some features in some paintings were based on optics. Other features totally the artist's imagination. So you better analyze the correct feature. If you analyze the wrong feature, you'll come to the wrong conclusion. So in this Arnolfini marriage by Jan van Eyck, where would optics be useful? Well, for the dog, if we magnify the dog, um, we can identify its species. It's a bichon. One of my colleagues in optical sciences raises bichons. And he assures me, if you take a picture of one of his dogs with a shutter speed any slower than a 500th of a second, it's a blur. <laughs> so either Van Eyck convinced the Arnolfinis to let him kill their dog and stuff it, <laughs> to project the image, or he had the skill to paint this at this great level. Many people misunderstand the logical uh, separateness between having the skill to do something and whether they did it or not. You may have lots of money, but that doesn't mean you can't rob a bank. The fact you have lots of money already is not proof you didn't rob the bank. So here, this shows he had the skill not to need optics, but I'll show you he did use optics. The shoes, he could have just done that by eyeball, but that chandelier, there's where optics would have been useful. That chandelier that's the size of your cupped palm. But optics don't make marks. You see a projected image in front of you and you're Jan van Eyck. You can look at it and go, oh, I don't like the shape of this. I'm gonna make that look like this. So even the features that are based on optics, you can alter. You're not um, a photocopy machine. So they're not photographs. So if we look at this famous painting, and we ask ourselves, is this painting based on optics? Well, if you analyze these features, you may find something in there that you can demonstrate optics was involved. If you analyze this feature, you're gonna conclude optics wasn't involved, but you'd be wrong in concluding that the painting is not based on optics because you've analyzed a feature that obviously wasn't based on optics. <coughs> the Arnolfini marriage has a chandelier in the back. We magnify the chandelier. The chandelier is round. So if the chan uh, sorry, not the chandelier, the mirror is round. So this convex um, mirror is round. If, if it was based on an optical projection and the lens was below the mirror, it would have been an oval, or above it would be an oval. So if optics were used, the lens has to be roughly at that height. Well, what is at that height? Is the man in blue Van Eyck, and the curtain behind him, his camera obscura, with the bright object, his concave mirror. That's what a camera obscura looks like. It's just it's a curtain. curtain. And for those of you who, again, know too much optics, you may say, well, it's a square uh, concave mirror. They can't be a square. Yes, they can. Go grind yourself a square concave mirror. And we've done that. I mean, it's easy to do. So I'm going to show you now <coughs> optical evidence that um, shows you that in the, I, a very small selected uh, bunch of the optical evidence, because given the limited amount of time, from this painting by Lorenzo Watto, done 75 years before Galileo. When I first visited David Hockney's studio in Los Angeles, it's built on a former tennis court. Okay, that's the length scale of it. And he collected together color photocopies of paintings that he considered worthy of further study. And he'd done it like a scientist. They're organized chronologically. Paintings are Northern Europe on the upper wall, Southern Europe on the lower wall, looking for connections, like Mendeleev putting together the periodic table. What's happening in column three? Is, is there anything? related to row 42 of the periodic table. And one painting in particular caught my eye, and we've extracted all sorts of evidence from that. And I'm gonna spend a bit of time talking about this painting. Husband and wife, I want you to remember there's a woman in the painting because she's going to serve as my meter stick. Um, the first thing we notice is this central pattern goes out of focus, appears to go out of focus, no big deal. You know, we've all seen that before. Here's a photograph, goes out of focus. We're so used, to, so indoctrinated, if you will, by looking at projected images by photographs. We've all seen billions of them by this point in our life. 
So you think this is perfectly natural. But it's not. If you were there, you would have looked at this wine bottle, it would have been in focus. You would have looked at the car back there. Your brain wouldn't have bothered telling you that I will cause the muscles in your pupils to contract so that the automobile is in focus, and you mentally construct a picture that's entirely in focus. If you've never projected an image, you've never seen simultaneously part of the scene in focus, part out of focus. Again, strong circumstantial evidence that a lens was used. One set of vanishing lines in the front, a second obvious set further back, and I'll show you in a minute there's a third set. If we try to correct for perspective the entire octagonal pattern, there's nothing we can do. I mean, we can't get it right. You can see that that's not a good octagonal pattern. That's too short, that's too long. But if I take this feature and I put it back into the painting, and it goes out of focus somewhere in here, if I look at the depth, same depth of the painting where this goes out of focus, another feature, bring that back out, one set of vanishing lines in the front, another set in the back, and then we have a lot more to say about this when we get to infrared in a few minutes. So um, I'll just leave it at that for the moment. I, we won't talk about the personal stuff. And we can reproduce this. Here's a, um, I mount a camera on a tripod. The only thing I can move is I can move the lens forward or back to focus in or out. Nothing else can change. I take a photograph. And what I've done is I take <coughs> this entire photograph and I just crop off the back. Now I focus by moving my lens toward the camera focus midway back, take another picture, and paste that together in Photoshop. So I paint this, I refocus my image, I paint that. Looks perfectly reasonable. But if I look at it more carefully, it's not. The ruler's bent by three degrees. So let's, in spite of me already telling you that a uh, octagonal pattern doesn't fit, when it's <coughs> perspective, let's try anyway. To the scale that I can calculate things in accurate units. So I've got a scale on here, but we're not gonna use that right now. I will correct for perspective, take away the ruler, put this aside, and I'll put it on top of the carpet and see how well it fits. Well, it depends on what kind of scientist you are and how desperate you are when you go to the scientific meeting with your data. You might say, <laughs> notice the perfect agreement we get. <laughs> and then um, somebody in the audience says, yeah, but it doesn't fit there at all. You go, ah, you're wrong because this is not what Lorenzo Lotto would have seen if he projected that carpet with a sim simple, a high magnification, and I told you we're gonna to go to the magnification in a minute using the woman as our ruler, he would have seen this. That's several depths of field into the painting, can't even see it. Well, let's make use of what we can, we'll fill in the details in the front, and then refocus by pulling the lens toward the, can the um, <coughs> camera, the canvas, and, whoa, oh, it fits great. It doesn't fit in the front, but it doesn't matter. We've already painted that in. So we'll continue, we'll paint this in, and we'll refocus another time, and we paint that in. It fits extremely well, but not perfectly. The woman is our a meter stick. The distance across her shoulders in the paintings is 10 inches. The distance across a real woman's shoulders is 18 inches. I know because I have a wife and two daughters. <laughs> got three data points. <laughs> In the land of the data points, a man with three data points is king. <laughs> More data points than exist in our history. The magnification of the painting is 0.56. This is very large magnification. It's, it's approaching life size. If you have uh, only ever uh, experienced taking photographs with autofocus compact cameras, you're taking a scene that's two meters tall, and you're cramming it onto a sensor that's a centimeter tall at best. Very tiny magnification. This is taking him and projecting him onto a sensor that was this big. That tells us the spacing between the uh, triangular pattern goes out of focus five to nine repeat distances in. I can convert that to real units of centimeters. Two equations from geometrical optics. I know the magnification in the front the depth of field in the front, I've just extracted that. There are three regions, six equations, seven unknowns. That alone blows the minds of most audiences. Um, six equations, seven unknowns, what is that? This is it. 
That moment they told us about in high school where one day algebra would save our lives. <laughs> Most general audiences, when I say six equations of seven unknowns, you should see the panic on the faces. It's like, a, there's going to be a quiz. So if I make one assumption, I'm going to make the assumption with error bars of that the lens was about four feet from the carpet. And we put error bars in and all that kind of stuff. That gives me all the magnifications, all the depths of field. So geometrical optics dictate that if a lens was used, there have to be three regions with three sets of magnifications. Well, let's see how well that fits. The distance from that kink to this kink after refocusing decreases by 13.1%. I calculate from my seven equations and six unknowns, it should have decreased by 12.6%. It agrees to a half a percent accuracy, which is sort of better than any experiment I've ever done on molecular beam epitaxy. <laughs> Back here, it decreases by a different amount, but I calculate a different amount. And again, it agrees with half a percent accuracy. So we're not saying that optics is the only way to get perspective correct. We're actually saying optics is the only way to get perspective wrong in exactly the way these artists got perspective wrong. Could go to the infrared, see what else we can get. Infrared is really useful. There's a splotch of red paint. Um, you know, so what? Let's look at that in the infrared. We can see through the red. And the reason for that is, and the reason why this is of interest, paintings <coughs> of this period were done on canvas or wooden panels with a white gesso um, wash put on first. On top of that, we'll put pigments, and the pigments are usually of order 20 micron thick. Turns out that's really nice. It's not incredibly thick, and the result is if we shine light, the full spectrum, including infrared, well, if we shine it on a black uh, part of the, the painting, nothing comes back, that's why it's black. If we shine it on the blue part of the painting, only the blue comes back, Green, by now the infrared is penetrating, but we don't know that because we can't see in the infrared. And red, for infrared, we really love red because the infrared penetrates really well. Modern cameras have trouble with the infrared because the infrared comes to a focus at a different place. So a modern camera puts a visible bandpass filter that only allows the visible through, so the infrared can't come through. And I'll show you in a minute more why that's the case. <coughs> if we got rid of the visible filter and only allowed the infrared through, what could we see? Well, if there were underdrawings, we could see them. So here's a typical CMOS sensor. It has a band gap in the infrared of uh, uh, 1,100 nanometers. Here's an infrared blocking filter, only allows through the visible. If we take away that and replace it with a visible blocking filter that lets through the infrared, we have this situation. The lens itself is happy to transmit infrared. So we have all the uh, optical designers spent lots of time to make sure that red, blue, green all come to a focus out of the CMOS sensor, but the infrared comes to a focus further away. That's a problem. So because the sensor, the silicon sensor, it's happy to respond to the infrared, unlike your eyeball, and it gives you a blurry feature. So the manufacturers have had to put this IR blocking filter in place. We're just gonna take that and get rid of it and put in a visible blocking filter Infrared's still in the wrong place, but we can easily correct for that. The optics, um, the focusing is done by a separate mechanism. You focus on the visible and then offset. And you'll have a perfectly auto-focus, um, auto-exposure infrared camera. So let's see what we can do with that. Here's a painting that's in the University of Arizona um, Museum after the laws of perspective have been invented. Now, what we said is red, the infrared likes to penetrate. And it'll hit the white gesso background and be reflected. So any place where we're red, when we look in the infrared, we'll expect to see that to be bright. Um, dark uh, materials that absorb the infrared will remain dark in the infrared, in the infrared camera. 